Welcome everybody, those who are here in person and those who are watching remotely. Um, we're really happy to have you with us today. So this is the start of the um, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health monthly lecture that runs from September 2024 through June 2024. And, um, and I just uh, shout out that um, the October lecture is um, October 4th, and that'll be part of our annual conference. Nancy Rigotti will be our, our uh, keynote speaker or our monthly, monthly lecture um, for October. And um, so we're kicking off really with a terrific one of our own, a terrific lecture from Shari Gadanga. And you see the title here in the title slide. So um, I'm going to have Phil Adis, who was one of Shari's mentors, um, give a proper introduction. But before we go there, I want to just make one little other announcement. And I think I advanced the slides this way. Yay. Which other one? <laughs> oh, this one. OK. All right. Thank you. So um, we have post uh, two postdoctoral fellowships available, and the details are on this slide. Um, it's a great place to work, and uh, you will see the quality of the work in Sherry's uh, presentation. We do uh, great stuff up here, and the uh, postdoctoral fellowships uh, are available with Sarah Heil, um, and uh, who's working in collaboration with Kelly Peck on this project that for which she's recruiting a a fellow, and then also Stacy Sigmund. So if you're interested, please uh, get in touch with uh, Sarah or uh, Stacy. And with that, I will turn this over to my colleague, Phil Adis, who will do a, an introduction. Okay. Should we go back to the, yeah, okay, good. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm very, by the way, it's great to have both an enormous crowd here in, in person, and yet I'm sure a much larger crowd uh, online. So thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Sherry uh, Kadango, who I've known for more than 10 years, as she did her medical residency here before her cardiology fellowship. And as is characteristic of your best fellows, it's probably the same with postdocs, is she came and spoke to me when she was a medical resident about possible research she could do when she's a cardiology fellow. Because a lot of things, you don't just start a study when you're a fellow or a PhD. There's so much stuff you have to do beforehand, IRBs and so on and so on. Uh, so it really helps having that head start. Uh, Sherry grew up, you'll be surprised, in Alabama and went to college at Brown University where she majored in uh, human biology and history. And she did med school at the University of South Alabama before she came up to the University of Vermont, which was the best decision she made. Um, when she uh, was a cardiology fellow, or no, when she's a, a junior faculty, she was a project director <coughs> on our VCBH, Vermont Center on Behavior and Health, COBRA, which is a large grant that we got Steve Higgins was the PI. I was the associate PI called the COBRA, Center of Biological Research Excellence. And for that, you had to have young faculty members uh, who you're betting on to not only be effective young faculty and publish, but to get an R01. You were graded on your success by how many of your five project directors, we call them, got an R01. And Sherry, was one of our successful bets. Uh, she did a, a project entitled Early Case Management on Recovery from a Cardiac Event in Women. And while she was doing that, we also worked together on a study that we had put together when she was a medical resident on high intensity interval training in women in cardiac rehab. And that was published in JAMA Cardiology. So Sherry really had the ball rolling. Uh, her first R01 submission was entitled Optimizing Aerobic Fitness and Functional Response to Exercise in Older Adults 
And that was funded with her first submission scoring at the 14th percentile, which is extremely uh, uh, successful. At this present point in time, she has roughly 30 publications and she is director of cardiac rehab uh, and attending cardiologist here at the University of Vermont. So today she is the opening lecture for the 12th round of the VCBH monthly lecture series. And she'll speak on novel therapeutics for type two diabetes, obesity, and heart failure, practical recommendations. It's all yours, Sherry. Thank you for that kind introduction. Um, you know, with this talk, what I hope to allow for the audience to understand is that there's novel drugs that are now out on the market that have multiple uses for not only treating diabetes, but also for management of heart failure and obesity. So this is gonna be a little bit more focused on sort of the clinical side, as opposed to um, some of the research that I do, but there's a nice overlap because a lot of the research that I focus on through the help of VCBH is focusing on both primary and secondary prevention with lifestyle management being a key component. And there's aspects such as diabetes and obesity that really do influence the development of cardiovascular disease. And so hopefully from today's talk, you'll be able to better understand the different medical managements that we have available and how to incorporate that into your practice, or even how to kind of mention that to patients you may see for counseling or for them to consider and have a discussion with their uh, provider. And so the main objectives for today is to discuss the prevalence of obesity, diabetes, mellitus, as well as congestive heart failure. And then secondly, we'll review the novel therapeutics uh, that are used to treat these chronic conditions. So obesity has become the most prevalent chronic condition in the United States, affecting roughly 40% of individuals. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see how over the years, the U.S. population has become more obese, which is defined as having a body mass index that's greater than 30 and sadly, when you really start to look and classify individuals who are overweight, meaning that they have a BMI that's greater than 25, that percentage dramatically increases to over 70% of the U.S. population. And the reason why I highlight this is it's important to recognize that obesity is an epidemic and it's heavily influenced by genetic as well as psychological and environmental factors and has been associated with poor mental health outcomes as well as reduced quality of life. And so it's really important as providers that we recognize this and figure out ways to further manage this condition. And so the point of this slide, it's a little bit busy, but what I kind of want you to take away from this slide is that from a cardiac standpoint, obesity itself is really a challenge. And this is partly due to the fact that the treatment for certain conditions can then first further worsen um, weight gain. And so examples that I tell both patients when they're sort of having this frustration of trying to lose weight and not understanding, you know, I keep gaining weight and I haven't changed anything in terms of my diet, I'm still exercising. Patients who may see me for hypertension management or for heart failure, oftentimes they're on a medication called a beta blocker. So that can be something uh, like metoprolol, atenolol, and that medication can contribute to weight gain, and that can be anywhere between five to eight pounds, depending on the patient. Um, another thing that we'll oftentimes see is for smokers in particular, especially a lot of my female patients who are active smokers, they're very hesitant to quit smoking because they're so worried about uh, further weight gain. And so, you know, when you're trying to have this risk versus benefit discussion with patients, it's often challenging. For example, those patients who are diabetics and have to be on insulin, insulin itself will contribute to weight gain. And so we need to recognize that some of the treatment that we do will contribute, and yet that's all the more reason why to provide aggressive counseling on lifestyle management. Um, and then also we need to take into account that those who are overweight or obese they may have physical limitations that may hinder them from exercising. They could have osteoarthritis of the knees or back pain. And so it's really important that as providers, we kind of take into account what the barriers can be for the patient and how to further tailor therapy in order to help them attain and achieve the appropriate weight loss. 
And shifting gears, when we kind of look at, you know, the epidemic of diabetes and congestive heart failure, data from CDC in 2021 had shown that roughly 38 million Americans, um, which is about 12% of the U.S. population, have some form of diabetes, and that's including type 1 as well as type 2 diabetes. And in the United States alone, over 6.5 million patients have some form of congestive heart failure. And it's important to recognize that for both diabetes and heart failure, they often occur concomitantly and each disease will then independently increase the risk of having the other disease or having a exacerbation. Um, and so it's really important that we identify and implement optimal treatment strategies for those who are living with diabetes and heart failure. And it's really important to improve outcomes in this very high risk patient population. And so this is a nice slide that kind of shows you, you know, the pathophysiology in terms of how hyperglycemia and insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, which typically occur from diabetes, can then trigger this sort of cascade um, and lead to a lot of deleterious effects, which then contribute to the development of heart failure and diabetes mellitus. So when we see patients in the hospital who come in decompensated heart failure, one of the things I always drill into the fellows or the APPs is trying to figure out what was that trigger? What was the cause that led to the episode? Sometimes it can be something as simple as medication noncompliance, dietary indiscretion, but also aspects such as an infection or uncontrolled diabetes. Those are things that can then trigger further decompensation. And so it's really important that we try to find the underlying trigger and recognize that controlling diabetes really does have an impact on the effect of someone's management of heart failure. And so because we know that those with diabetes have an increased risk for cardiovascular disease, um, the FDA in 2008 actually mandated that all diabetic drugs must demonstrate cardiovascular safety. And so typically in the past, we thought of drugs like insulin or metformin, you know, which will affect the insulin release and sensitivity. But now there are newer meds, which I'll go into a bit more detail, detail that can really help. Um, and it's due to the different mechanisms at which they help lower the glucose control as why it's getting a lot more prevalence. So there's three classes in particular um, that are newer to the market. The first is called a glucagon-like peptide receptor agonist. And um, I'll be referring to that as a GLP-1 receptor antagonist agonist. Um, and how that medicine works is that it increases insulin release. It will also increase glucose uptake and glycogen synthesis. And then it delays the gastric emptying and it kind of makes you feel fuller. And so that's the reason um, how that medication can help lower uh, glucose. The other is called a DPP-4, which is an enzyme. And what that does is it actually breaks down uh, GLP-1. And so then it further enhances the effect of what GLP-1 receptor agonists will do. And then thirdly is the sodium glucose code transporter 2 inhibitors, which uh, we often refer to as SGLT2 inhibitors. And those are designed to reduce the blood glucose primarily by um, the patient urinating the glucose out. So it's through urinary glucose excretion. And so this is a table that's kind of showing what these newer medications um, are used for. And so if you look, uh, it's broken down into the class as well as the mechanism, mechanism of action. Um, the trade names, because I think oftentimes you may hear the brand names as opposed to what the generic name is. And then, you know, a common question that I think as providers we oftentimes get is what is the risk of hypoglycemia? And it's really important to note that these newer medications really do not increase the risk of hypoglycemia. And because of that, that's one of the reasons why it's oftentimes used for patients who are not diabetic but then they would have an additional benefit, whether it be for heart failure or for um, coronary artery disease. And we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. And then we need to kind of think about, you know, what do these medications have in terms of weight? So like I had mentioned, the older drugs like insulin can cause weight gain, 
but some of these newer drugs actually uh, do show some improvement in weight loss. And so the first is the SGLT2 inhibitors, and those are medications like Jardiance or Farsiga, which you may have seen on TV, which uh, work by promoting the renal excretion of glucose. And it does drop the hemoglobin A1C, which is a measure to determine the severity of diabetes by half a point. Um, but in addition to the effect of glucose control, it also has some additional benefits. So for those who um, are diabetic, being on a medication like Jardiance has actually shown to reduce the risk of a heart attack stroke, as well as a cardiovascular death by 14% compared to uh, placebo. Additionally, it also has been found to reduce heart failure uh, admissions. And so a lot of patients who may not necessarily have diabetes may be on this medication because of its effect on heart failure. But one of the things that I want you to take away is that you know, we always think about heart failure, diabetes control, but it really does have a significant improvement in reducing recurrent MI and cardiovascular mortality for patients who are diabetic. So it's all the more reason why we need to get patients who have diabetes and coronary artery disease on this medication if they're able to tolerate it. The next class is the GLP-1 receptor agonists, and those, like I had mentioned, um, will stimulate the insulin secretion, and then they suppress uh, glucagon. And then this class has also been shown to reduce cardiovascular mortality uh, amongst those who have diabetes. And it's also been associated recently with significant weight loss. And so because of that, several medications in that particular category have actually been FDA approved for weight loss, regardless of the presence of diabetes. Um, I should mention that with the GLP-1 receptor agonists, the majority of them are injectable with the exception of one medicine called semetaglutide, which um, you can actually take by a subcutaneous form as well as an oral form. Um, and usually the injectable medications are sort of like an extended release medication that they take, and it varies whether it's from uh, a week to um, every 10 days, depending on which medication, but typically it's once a week injection. Um, and then last, you know, of the kind of newer medications is the DPP-4. And with that, it's not as commonly used, um, I think compared to the other medications, it's still a good drug, um, but it's been shown to sort of have a neutral benefit in terms of doesn't really help uh, cardiac patients doesn't provide this mortality benefit compared to SGLT2 or GLP-1 receptor agonists. And secondly, especially for my patients who I see um, in the heart failure clinic, if they are on this medication, I tend to work with the primary care doctor or the endocrinologist to get them off of this medicine, as it has been shown to potentially increase the risk of uh, heart failure exacerbation. And so really wanting to kind of prevent any potential heart failure episodes, I usually will get patients off of this and switch them to a different agent. Um, and it doesn't really tend to have any effect uh, in terms of, of weight. And so it's a great drug if you really don't have a cardiac problem. Um, but for those who have some form of cardiovascular disease, then I would recommend that this not be uh, one of the meds that we use in our toolkit. Uh, and lastly, which uh, especially medical students or trainees may be very familiar with, is the glitazone drugs, which tend to work by increasing the insulin sensitivity. Um, it does lower the risk of A1C, but it is at the risk of gaining weight, and it does contribute to heart failure exacerbation. So this is sort of the big like no-no medication from a cardiovascular standpoint that we definitely try to get patients off, um, and because this medicine was known to increase the risk of heart failure exacerbations. That's what led to the FDA mandate in 2008 to make sure that newer drugs on the market would show uh, cardiovascular safety. And so this is a really nice slide um, that really does show sort of the benefits of the medication like Jardiance or Persega, which is the SGLT2 inhibitor 
And I like this because it really does kind of show from a different level what the benefits are. And so if you look at those who've had a prior MI, uh, whether it be two years ago or just a history of um, having an MI, meaning that they've had a heart attack, you see that it really does have a tremendous effect, not only on the overall MACE, but also in reducing cardiovascular and heart failure events, and then also helps with uh, renal function. Um, and then when you're starting to look at those patients where, you know, we know that they have coronary disease, but there's no documentation of a prior heart attack, the evidence is a little bit out there in terms of does it actually help with MACE, but we do know it still has a benefit in terms of heart failure and um, kidney disease. And then now we're starting to kind of look at what are the effects if you're doing it from a primary prevention standpoint. So meaning patients who, for example, don't have uh, established coronary disease that we're aware of, and yet they may have been diagnosed with heart failure, there is benefit for those patients to be on that medication. And so really there's a lot of uh, benefit for patients who need to be on this medicine. And again, this was initially studied in those who had type two diabetes. And from there, it has now um, been approved for different uses for those without diabetes. And again, this is another way to kind of show in terms of those who have heart failure that it does reduce the occurrence of cardiovascular death or heart failure episode. And the one thing that people may not be fully aware of is that within heart failure, there's sort of two classes. One is called preserved ejection fraction. So meaning that you have a normal heart pumping function. Um, people who have that type of heart failure often may be obese, have metabolic syndrome, diabetes. Then there's a second called heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And patients with that oftentimes may have had a prior heart attack or a severe cardiovascular event or an infiltrative disease um, that can then cause a drop in their ejection fraction. And this medicine really is beneficial for both types of heart failure. And it's actually the only medication that is approved to treat patients who have heart failure with preserved EF. And so, you know, in terms of the benefit of those with reduced EF, not only does it lower the events, like I mentioned, but it does reduce all cause mortality. So it's really important that we try to get patients on this. And similarly, for those who even have a hef -PEF, we need to be working on including that as part of the management um, to help reduce the recurrence of another event. And so this is a slide of the more traditional medications um, that you are probably aware of. You know, metformin is still the first line treatment for patients with diabetes or those who are pre-diabetic. So meaning that we oftentimes have a A1C between 5.7 and 6.4. Once you have an A1C of 6.5, then you're labeled as a, a diabetic. Um, but depending on what the A1C level is, I usually don't end up substituting a medication like an SGLT2 inhibitor in lieu of metformin, but rather I will add to it because I know, like we had mentioned before, that this does not uh, contribute to hypoglycemia. So I really don't have to be too worried in terms of that standpoint of uh, a patient having an issue and being able to tolerate both medications. Um, and so when I see these patients in clinic, you know, I will work with the primary care doctor or the endocrinologist to work on optimizing their medications um, and really trying to make sure that they aren't on a medication like the glitazone, which was on the previous slide, and then the other medication is the sulfonylurea, um, which has been shown to actually uh, not only increase weight, but then it can potentially uh, lead to another uh, contributor for a CHF exacerbation. And so those are sort of the main medications that we try to avoid as, as cardiologists. Um, but I really think that it's important moving forward that we really take a look and see, you know, what is the patient on in terms of their medications and thinking about what are the utility of, you know, if we just see a patient who's only on insulin, there is benefit for them to be on some of these newer agents, especially not only from a glucose control, but knowing that there's a cardiovascular mortality benefit. 
So in terms of some things to be aware of, as much as I praise these medications, there are um, a few red flags and you need to be careful um, when you recommend this. So in terms of the GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists, and remember, those are the ones that are more effective kind of towards the, the weight loss or the injectable medications. Um, the most common side effect is nausea and sort of GI upset. So when patients have trouble tolerating that medication, it is usually because of GI complaints. Um, and usually up to 50% of patients will have some form of GI complaints. Um, and so that's very common. And that's just sort of how the medicine works is if you're having such kind of abdominal pain or diarrhea, you're not as uh, wanting to eat as much, can't really tolerate the food. So it creates a little bit of food aversion. So that's kind of what further helps with uh, the weight loss. Um, this medicine in particular needs to be avoided in patients with a personal or family history of thyroid cancer or those who may have this special kind of hereditary syndrome called uh, multiple endocrine neoplasia. In terms of the DPP uh, four inhibitors, those medications are usually taken orally um, and it does need to be renally dosed. So if you have kidney disease, you have to be careful about the dosing. The most common side effect from that is actually having arthralgias, meaning joint pain. Um, and as I mentioned, it can potentially lead to worsening heart failure um, in patients who have established coronary disease. And lastly, the SGLT2 inhibitor um, Really the main thing to be careful about with that is if someone has had a history of recurrent UTIs, meaning urinary tract infection or yeast infections, um, then we tend to uh, avoid using that class of medication because it can increase the risk of those infections. Um, I also counsel patients, you know, because it's a medicine in which it kind of enhances diuresis. So kind of will make you pee more than what's uh, sort of natural. It can lead to volume depletion. So you can have dehydration. Um, sometimes it can potentially uh, lower blood pressure. Um, usually it is a well-tolerated drug, but especially with you know the Vermont summer and the heat that we've been having, I kind of counsel patients to be cautious. And if it's a really hot day, then it's okay for them to skip that medication for, for once a day. Um, it also increases the risk of what's called euglycemic DKA. And essentially what makes this medicine challenging is that you can have effects from having a high glucose, but the glucose number itself isn't that elevated. And so it can kind of mask and you can be tricked into not realizing that someone's really having high glucose levels. The risk of this is pretty low, but if someone's going to be having a procedure and they're not going to be eating anything by mouth um, for a day or so, then we tell the patient to hold that medication to kind of reduce the risk of having uh, this event happen. And then it is safe for patients who have chronic kidney disease and it does slow down the progression. So, you know, I've been focusing and highlighting the benefits it has towards the heart, but if someone just has kidney disease without all of these other issues, that's another reason why uh, the patient may be on this medicine is to help slow the progression and severity of kidney disease. So alas, I have to obviously talk about the importance of medication management and exercise. You know, these medications have the potential to induce hypoglycemia either during or following exercise. But like I said, the vast majority especially those newer agents like the SGLT2, the GLP-1 agonist, they carry very minimal risk. And so it's not something that the patient has to worry about or if they're going to a gym or a rehab program that the staff needs to be uh, too concerned about. You know, the medicines that really do increase the risk of hypoglycemia, so meaning that your blood sugar would drop are the short acting insulin, uh, the sulfonylureas, and especially if you're on those medications along with the beta blocker, then it can kind of mask those symptoms. And so it's something to kind of be a little bit careful about if you notice that a patient is complaining of dizziness or lightheadedness, um, and then they happen to be on any of these agents. Uh, and then, like I said, because those newer medications depend on glucose in order to work, 
pathophysiology-wise, that's the reason why the risk of hypoglycemia is so low. And that is one of the reasons why patients without diabetes can be on this medication without any issues or um, having disturbances and side effects. Um, and, you know, still metformin is the number one medication. It's still sort of first line in terms of treatment. And while the risk of metformin causing hypoglycemia is quite low, you just have to be careful for those who may have liver disease if they're on that medication as it um, is excreted uh, by the liver. And so it may have to have a dose reduction if someone has uh, liver disease. So this is a really nice slide um, that kind of shows all of the different medications that are now FDA approved for the benefit of weight loss. You know, I think back in the day, at least I remember when I was a kid, there was this uh, thing called Orlistat and it was used in a lot of food. And so it was like these wow potato chips uh, and you could like eat this and it had the taste of eating like a Lay's bad, <laughs> you know, uh, chips, but didn't have any of the saturated fat. But the side effect of that medicine was that it would cause diarrhea and a lot of GI upset. So it kind of lost fad um, in the market and is not really used. Um, and then they sort of then came out with uh, a PO form, which had a little bit less side effects compared to like when you were eating the different products, but again, um, wasn't well tolerated. And then in 2012 is really sort of the first time I would say that a medication came out that had true uh, weight loss benefit that was pretty well tolerated uh, for patients trying to, to lose weight. And so the fentiramine to pyramate, you know, uh, from a cardiovascular standpoint is a little bit worrisome. Um, and I actually just had a provider ask me last week if they can start a patient of mine who has heart failure with reduced EF um, on this medication. And I said, no. And the primary doctor was kind of wondering like what, you know, if this could help with weight loss, like why not? And the fentiramine is actually uh, a class of amphetamine. And so the way that it works is it, you know, increases your adrenaline rush, catecholamines. And so it will contribute to an increased heart rate and increased blood pressure, which for our cardiovascular patients is not the ideal situation. Um, and so it's something that is more appropriate for individuals who perhaps are in their 20s or 30s, young adults. Um, who just have obesity, then that's something that you can consider. But if someone has borderline hypertension, or if they have any type of true cardiovascular disease or strong family history, then I would uh, avoid that patients refrain from using that medication. Um, and then in 2014, you know, the GLP-1 came on the market. And it's interesting because it wasn't, it's still quite expensive. And I'll be honest, you know, this came out during my residency training and I wasn't fully familiar with it in terms of weight loss. It was a newer medication used solely for, for diabetes management. And I think that it just wasn't used into everyday practice at that time because of the cost of the drug. Um, and then similarly in that same year, a uh, newer medication came out, which is especially for the behavioralists, I'm sure are very familiar with the propion naltrexone combination, which does a good job of weight loss. Um, you know, from a cardiovascular standpoint, that medication itself can increase blood pressure. So it's one of the meds that I try to avoid um, if a patient is interested in weight loss. Uh, and I think as you're familiar with the bupropion, you know, it is a form of an antidepressant and it's great to help for those who are interested in quitting smoking, but it also can potentially increase uh, the suicide risk for someone who may have a uh, major depression. And so it's just something to be a little bit cognizant about when you're trying to choose the, the right medication. And then, uh, you know, in recent years, we have gotten the medications, somatoglutide, terzepatide, and these are the two meds, um, again, that are in the GLP-1 agonists that are approved for weight loss. Wagovi is the same as Ozempic. The difference is the dosage, and it gets very confusing for patients when they're trying to ask and get on weight loss medications and 
depending on what you're trying to treat, even with insurance. So Ozempic is a lower dose uh, semetaglutide that is only approved for diabetes. And so if you have patients who are on that, they have to have some form of diabetes. And then, you know, an added bonus is that they get to have weight loss as well. For Wagovi, that is a much higher dose compared to Ozempic. And Wagovi is the only one that's truly approved for weight loss, regardless of whether or not someone has uh, diabetes. And the big difference between Wagovi and Ozempic is if I'm able to, I have my patients, if they qualify and if it's needed, I will use it for a way to, um, you know, cross the hurdle to jumpstart weight loss. You know, they're making all of these lifestyle changes and we focus on that first. And then if I see that they, you know, putting in the work, but they're still not able to get this dramatic reduction, then I will um, add Ozempic to, to the mix. My hesitation with Wagovi is that there's still not that much data out there in terms of the long-term effects. Since it is a higher dose um, than Ozempic. And then the rebound weight gain is much higher with Wagovi compared to Ozempic. So for patients who decide to discontinue Ozempic, you may have a rebound weight gain of anywhere between eight to 10 pounds. Um, but for Wagovi, it will be anywhere between 15 to 30. And so usually as a rough estimate, what they'll say, um, which is a little bit frightening is, you know, the weight loss that you've experienced from Wagovi, if you come off of that medicine, then you'll gain back that weight and then double. And so that's sort of why, from my standpoint, I'm a little bit hesitant to prescribe that just for pure weight loss, because I don't think there's enough data out there. Um, but we'll see. I think it's something that it may be worth using, but it's definitely one of the medications that you can't really have the patient stop compared to Ozempic. I do think that there is a way to sort of bridge that and help with the patient to come off of it. If you have a set plan and it takes time as to, you know, using this as a temporizing measure. And you have to be careful because when these patients come off of it, what you want to avoid is this fluctuation in weight loss, weight gain, weight loss, weight gain, because that really does have uh, effect on cardiovascular health as well. And so it really needs to be purposeful as to what are you using this medication for? How long do you want to be on it? And what are sort of the ramifications and implications uh, moving forward? And so for people who may not be familiar with actually how the medicine looks like, it is a very simple um, injectable pen. And you can see um, that it's given the dosage, you just click the dosage, and then all you have to do is just inject almost like a click pen. Um, and then you dispose of that pen. And it's something that is very user-friendly, easy to do. A lot of people who may be nervous with needles or have um, some ambiguity about how to use it really don't have any issues with it. And the needle is so small that you don't really tend to feel the, the puncture. Um, and you know, with these medications, while well, I've talked to you about some of the flaws, it does help tremendously with losing the weight. So for example, those who are on Ozempic, you know, the average weight loss is about 15 to 20% of their body weight, which is quite a lot. Um, and usually about a third of patients will experience at least 10% uh, weight loss. And so it's really uh, been one of the more effective drugs, especially when it can sort of kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. Uh, for a patient who is diabetic and has cardiovascular disease. And oh, by the way, perhaps they're overweight or obese, um, and then it can be of beneficial use. Um, but it's important to note that this is not a substitute for exercise. And so I really think it's important that we counsel that this is in addition to and think about an exit plan which is what I do for my patients who are on Ozempic, but by no means is this something that, oh, I can do whatever I want, don't need to exercise because I'm on this medication. And I think that's where we're not doing a great job of counseling and kind of promoting that this is in addition to, not a substitute.
And lastly, this is sort of what I want to emphasize as the main takeaway slide, you know, for patients who have cardiovascular disease, regardless of whether or not they have diabetes, it's important that we get the basic lab work. So obviously hemoglobin A1C to check diabetes, lipid panel, so checking your cholesterol levels as well as your kidney function. Um, and if there's really no contraindication, we should be thinking about starting them either on an SGLT2 inhibitor because we know that it decreases heart failure hospitalizations, can promote weight loss. The weight loss, I will say, is minimal. It's like two to five pounds, but hey, something is better than nothing. Um, and it also has been shown to reduce all cause mortality for those with diabetes, as well as uh, cardiovascular mortality, and it lowers blood glucose. Now, thinking about the GLP-1 receptor agonist, it does improve with weight loss, it lowers the blood glucose, and it does have a benefit of reducing cardiovascular mortality. Um, and so it's really important for us to kind of think about, is there an opportunity for us to introduce these medications and have the communication with the patient's primary care doctor or their endocrinologist? And it really just depends on the situation as to whether or not I myself will start the patient on this medication or if I will reach out to a different provider to help assist, especially if, let's say, the patient's on insulin and I am worried about potential uh, issues in trying to adjust the medication or use of that drug, then I'll reach out to kind of uh, get some assistance. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, any concerns. Hi. Um, thanks so much for your talk. It was really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, um, I've, I've heard of, you know, that there's been certain shortages with these types of medications like Ozempic. Um, and I was just wondering if those types of issues, um, access to these types of medications and sort of um, how you deal with those types of issues when you're Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So the question is asked was in terms of we see on the news that there's a shortage of Ozempic or Wagovi um, and how that's uh, affecting individuals who actually need those medications. So surprisingly, it's still an issue. Um, part of the reason why is now, and you may see whether it's online or on TV, that people are willing to pay out of pocket for these medications and can find a physician to prescribe it um, and kind of work the system to where the physician, and it can be like these consulting physicians that you see, the doc in the box, you know, um, where they will give you the prescription for Ozempic or Wagovi if you're willing to pay out of pocket. And some people are so desperate of wanting a quick solution for weight loss that they will end up getting the prescription. And then that takes away from people who actually are dependent on this drug. And unfortunately, there's no way to regulate that. Um, and it's interesting because it is almost getting to the point where we're so careful about use of narcotics or controlled substances like benzos and things like that, um, that it makes, you know, from a physician standpoint, makes us wonder, should there be some type of way to control this type of medication because it's being abused? Um, and it does have some dire consequences if it's not used correctly. Um, and so, you know, I don't think that it's been recognized of it being an issue and that the rampant use of abuse for people to get this prescription who don't really need it. Um, I don't think that's been addressed because the pharmaceutical company is making their money. Dr. Kadenga, um, so um, from a practicality standpoint, I think one group that I feel might benefit from these things are kind of like some of these older folks that are, have like a history of coronary artery disease, but maybe aren't overweight. They're kind of maybe like even close to underweight. 
And I wonder if, like, practically speaking, if based on prescribing to that uh, population, just because I guess I have heard fears of if you are causing weight loss in someone who's already, like, near uh, being underweight, that might be more harmful than beneficial, but. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So for patients I see in clinic, um, I have not been aggressive in starting the GLP-1 agonists for them. Um, even though there is this benefit if they are kind of borderline weight underweight, um, because I don't want them to get further weight loss and that can contribute to malnourishment and that in of itself will cause some issues. But for Jardians, I do end up trying to see um, if they're able to tolerate and it's sort of hit or miss. So one patient, I was able to start the medication and they were fine. They didn't have any weight loss. Um, like one pound and it was fine. Another patient lost like eight pounds. And so then I had to discontinue the medication. And so I think it depends on the patient. It's worth trying with Jardiance, but I have I would not feel comfortable doing it with the GLP-1 agonists. Um, Edward Seridarian asks, does um, glipizide have any effect on weight? The glipizide, if we go back to, uh, let's see. Yes, it is a sulfonylurea. And so I just want to double check because I'm like, I don't know the trainings as well as I used to. Um, but yes, it does contribute to uh, having weight gain. And it's one of those medications that it can contribute to potential CHF exacerbation. Um, and so from a cardiac standpoint, we tend to avoid uh, this medication as well as the glitazides, the glitazones, I should say. Yeah. Circles I travel in the addiction. A lot of interest in Ozempic and Wagovi are uh, decreasing smoke. Yeah, so it's interesting in terms of the smoking. So I have not looked at the data, but just kind of thinking about it, I think that with the weight loss, um, it improves self-confidence. And then at least I'm thinking of my female patients who are so reluctant to quit smoking. If they are losing the weight, then I feel like they would then be willing to at least engage in having a discussion about NRT and to quit smoking because they know that gaining weight won't be an issue. So I think that plays into sort of the psycholo psychological mindset. Um, in terms of the alcohol, so there's some literature to support that it will curb the drinking because the patients can't tolerate it because of the GI upset. They feel so nauseous um, and that it's just this aversion to having any type of alcohol or even certain like fatty foods. So it's kind of contributed to that uh, mindset. So I do think it's sort of different thinking, thinking in terms of the addiction of smoking versus uh, alcohol. That makes sense to me and Jordan. Yep. And usually when patients aren't able to tolerate the medicine, it's because the, the GI upset is so bad or they're not able to, you know, they can tolerate a lower dose. So it usually starts with 0.25, but they can't increase that dose because of the side effects. A lot of the theorizing among people are clinicians like you and don't know about the GI upset was that was decreasing, you know, Centrally, the rewarding effects of the drugs and whatnot, but I, I think your explanation makes sense. at least for the alcohol, yeah, yeah, that that I feel. But I do think it's interesting with the the smoking. Thanks, uh, it's a great presentation. Um, I'm curious to hear more about. And you know, I can imagine ways if you start a weight loss. That's in. Um, now it is, enables you to start exercising or vice versa. You see some success in going to your experience. Have you seen it go? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So there's been actually like sort of three different scenarios I've had um, in the past couple of months with patients starting the medication. 
So one patient uh, started the, our behavioral weight loss class, which is called Move to Lose. And so she was a 34 year old, you know, just overweight, no other history. And she started the class and she developed into this habit of exercising, had a little bit limitation with her knee because of the weight, but was still um, exercising and making dietary adjustments. And she lost about 10 pounds. And she was then interested in wanting to start uh, the medication to kind of further enhance, but she was very clearly following what she wanted to do um, in terms of lifestyle management. And so I discussed with her, like, this is an option, but keep in mind that if you were, because she would only qualify for Wagovi, if she was to start Wagovi, she would need to be on that medication long-term. We don't know the full um, long-term effects of that medication. And we do know that if you stop it, the rebound weight gain is so high. And so then after kind of talking to her again about that, she opted not to, and just like was satisfied with, you know, the 10 pounds. And I told her that you kind of hit this plateau and then your metabolism will get used to it. And then you'll get another, um, loss of exercise, but you know, what Phil always taught me, and I still say this to my patients, is that it's simple math to lose weight. You have to burn more than what you consume. And so when you have these patients who are like, I'm not eating anything. And I'm like, well, if you're eating that one cheeseburger for your only meal, that's, you know, 2000 calories. So clearly there's something. And so it's really having a very tailored discussion in terms of what's the appropriate medication. Now, I saw someone who came in for heart failure who uh, had reduced ejection fraction, and that patient was overweight. I wouldn't say obese, um, but he had some limitations with his back in terms of exercise, but he was motivated. He was like a 60-year-old guy. And so um, I said, okay, because you have diabetes, you have heart failure, and then he had a, a heart attack, I think, about six months before I'd seen him you know, you would benefit from being on Ozempic. And so we started him on that medicine. And then after he lost about eight pounds, he started to feel so much better that he then felt more kind of motivated to stick with exercise. And so then he was doing more time when he was coming into cardiac rehab and really was vigilant about kind of the benefit of being on this medication. Um, and so that helped him. And then my third patient, I used this person had borderline, well, was a diabetic, but um, we kind of played the system a little bit of like, do you really need to be an Ozempic, but you're young and you are overweight. And this individual was very motivated um, in wanting to do a healthy lifestyle and exercise. And so we talked about doing that, using Ozempic, and then that's going to be a bridge. And she was able to lose about 20 pounds. Um, and so we did it for six months and I counseled her, let's kind of do 20, knowing that you're going to have rebound weight gain. And for her, she only uh, rebound weight gain was five pounds, but she implemented the lifestyle changes. And so I think that you can use Ozempic in the right patient population as a short term but some will argue that, you know, you need to be on this like long-term it's to your benefit. It really just depends on what you're trying to, to do with that. You know, for that individual, she just had diabetes and hypertension. She didn't have a known history of cardiovascular disease or, or anything else. So I think it was fine for her to then come off of it because she achieved the weight loss that she wanted. A great talk. Uh, are there strategies that you implement that you've seen more success in helping people off the medication to try? Yeah. So before um, we taper it off, I specifically asked them, like, what are you doing in terms of diet and exercise? And so usually by the time the patient is talking with me, they're on sort of an established regimen of like, I'm exercising three times a week. This is what I'm doing for exercise. And I'm like, okay. And then like, what are you going to be able to do? You know, once the season changes kind of thinking about, okay, winter's coming. So what's your game plan? Are you going to join planet fitness? Like, that's great that you're doing the stuff outside. So we have a very clear cut plan as to what they're going to be doing in terms of exercise. 
Then the second piece is the nutrition. And so if they haven't seen a nutritionist, then I may end up giving them a referral just to make sure that they have all of the tools and set up for success. Um, so then when we stop the medication, I will warn the patient, like you're going to have some weight gain and that's okay. But that's sort of why we factor in that of like, what's your target weight loss. And then I'll see them back in clinic in like six months afterwards, specifically for weight loss just to kind of hold them accountable. And it does work. I mean, I think that's the other thing that, you know, you need to set a reasonable goal for a patient. So if I want a patient to lose ideally five pounds, I'll say seven because they never want to disappoint the doctor. They always get embarrassed, you know? So then they'll have some weight loss. I'll be like, Oh, I couldn't get to the seven, but you know, I lost four pounds and I'm like, four pounds is great. Like that is good. So it's really important for the provider to set some type of goal and to address it. So each time I see someone who's overweight, I ask, what are you doing for exercise? You know, what are we going to set the goal for weight loss at the next appointment? Same with smoking. Time after time, I'll ask the patient, are you interested in smoking? Yes or no. But I still address it every time. And I think we need to get into that habit in terms of obesity as well, of kind of recognizing that it has a huge impact on so many different um, body systems and that just like how diabetes isn't really just an endocrinologist problem anymore, obesity isn't just a metabolism problem anymore. I have another question for yeah. you. We had to learn over many years that with opiate addiction, therapy on the medication. So, you know, providers, if it's the patients, but they're on an opioid substitution on good and they think I don't need to be on this medication. Tell me that relapse just what so if this went with the Ozempic type drugs, if this went in the same direction, there's a lot of relapse if you take them off the drug, what's your understanding of the safe long term maintenance? Yeah, so that's the data is out there for Ozempic in terms of, you know, the long term outcomes. And that's where we can say like this does have cardiovascular mortality benefit. We've seen that, um, you know, reducing MACE rates and things like that. In terms of the higher dosage of the GLP-1 agonist, so medication like Wagovi, we don't know what the long term effect is. Um, you know, we highlight like, yes, this is great in terms of weight loss, but it does have an increased risk of pancreatitis. Um, it does have an increased risk for certain cancers, depending on what your family history is. And so because there's not that much data out there for Wagovi, that's why I'm a little bit hesitant. Um, but I do know that, like you said, you need to have something to kind of keep you status quo and maintenance. And so that's a lot harder to pull away, especially knowing that you're going to getting back all the weight you lost plus more. Um, and I don't think there's a great solution for, for that piece. Um, but I it just, it always makes me nervous to just fully rely on a medication where we don't know the long-term outcomes. Sorry, it was a fantastic. Those who are the remote audience, I hope you will. So that's it. Thanks very much.